everybody. Here we are, ready to worship the Lord again. This is the day the Lord has made, and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. So we're here to rejoice together this morning, the few of us who are here to take, and we're hoping that you're gathering with us in your homes or wherever you meet to, to watch, and we're just so thankful for when you tune in and worship along beside us. And we're looking forward to opening soon. I think the COVID is going away by, in Jesus' name, the COVID is going away, and we are going to be able to open our doors and have fellowship together once again. I'm excited about that because I know that God is on the move and he is able to do all that we ask or think, or even more than we ask or think. So praise God today. And so let's just invite him in today in, and ask him to lead and guide everything that we do and say today. Father, we thank you for the day that you made. We thank you that you are a sovereign God. You are a mighty God, a holy God. And Father, we thank you for all of your attributes, Lord, that your mercies endure forever, and your loving kindness is better than life, and your grace is everlasting, Lord, and your love is everlasting. And we thank you, Father, because you loved us, because you loved us from the beginning of time and made a plan so we could come and live with you forever. Father, that we can have a doorway to your throne room anytime because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, for your stripes, that you paid the stripes for our healing. We thank you for the blood you shed on the cross at Calvary, that you died for us, Jesus, and that you rose again. And now you make intercession for us so we can come to the Father through you. So we thank you, Holy Spirit, for dwelling in us. And we thank you, Father, that you had this plan from the very beginning of time, that you loved us so much that when you created us, you created us with love in mind. We thank you, Father, that we can come together to worship you and praise you and give you the glory in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we are going to come here and do some worship together. Praise Him. Hallelujah. Ah! 
The roof material has to provide adequate shade, yet be sparse enough so rain can get in and stars can be seen through it. The suka should leave a person vulnerable to the elements. Is that right? It should leave a person vulnerable to the elements. Next, we will look at a few pictures of some suka. suka. So the process of building and living in a suka is a great adventure for children. It's like building a fort and camping out in the backyard. People commonly decorate their su suka. It's fun for the kids, often more fun than decorating a Christmas tree. <laughs> Families hang harvest decorations and handmade artwork from the walls. During the course of the seven days of suka, it is appropriate to eat one's meals in a suka and if the climate permits to sleep at night inside the suka. Hosting guests in the suka for special holiday meals is a big part of the festival. It's a great time of fellowship. Suka is a time of joy and celebration, a time to celebrate the harvest and revel in God's goodness. The festival of Sukkot comes at harvest time. The joyous mood of Sukkot is a dramatic shift from the solemn and austere tone of the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The celebration of Sukkot is so joyous that Jewish liturgy often refers to it as the season of our rejoicing. The commandment to move outside of one's comfortable zone and live in a booth is meant to remind us that God is our provider, sustainer, and protector. On the cycle of sanctification, Sukkot is an annual opportunity to revel in God's goodness and take delight in our redemption. Sukkot is the culmination of all the appointed times. It is to the other festivals what the Sabbath is to the other six days of the week. It is a prophetic picture of the coming kingdom. It foreshadows the great celebration when the entire world will live in peace and brotherhood under the reign and rule of the righteous Messiah King. And now Pastor Fonda will come with the message. We are so thrilled to be able to bring the word of God this morning to you. This has been a wonderful week. I don't know how many of you know that there was a march on the capital of our nation this weekend. It was led by Franklin Graham and uh, many other spiritual leaders across the land attended. And it was so inspirational. And it met as a prayer walk, a prayer for our nation. And there were so many different areas of prayer that were sent up to the heavenlies this weekend by tens of thousands of people that know the Lord and know that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And there's never been a time where our land needed healing more than this time. It, from the time we became a nation, and there were documents, law, legal documents formed and died for. Our Constitution is a precious thing that we govern by in our country. And we pray for those who are in charge of seeing that it is rightly divided, like the Supreme Court and the people in the Senate and in the House, at all of the branches of the government, the, the legislative branch, Lord, the, especially the president, he carries a weight on his shoulders that no other carries across this whole world. He has the weight of the world on his shoulders, and thank God he has people around him who have directed him on how to give his burdens over to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who is the only one who could really carry 
the burdens of the world on his shoulders. And he did that way back 2,000 years ago when he carried the cross to Mount Calvary. And he was hung on it. And he died there for our sins. And he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And now he's with the Father on the right-hand side of the Father's throne, making intersection for you and me. I'm just so thankful to live in a country where our leader knows the Lord is, a, is important to be in control. And I'm thankful for the other men are, are surrounding him who know the Lord on a personal basis too and have held him up in prayer. And there are so many across the nation who are praying for our president. It's amazing to me to see when so many came together this weekend. And not only the ones, the tens of thousands that were there, there were screens online and on, on uh, television stations of the meeting and of the wonderful time in the Lord that went on this weekend. And I pray this will be a turning point for America where we will learn to love one another like we should. No matter race or creed or religion, dom denominations don't matter. We need to break down all those walls and come together like the one new man and love each other and treat each other with respect and honor one another, in fact, prefer one another to ourselves. When we can come to a point in history where our nation can do that, there is not a limit to what can be accomplished. And I know God is getting ready to do a great awakening in our land, that many, many people will hear of the great love of Jesus and that he is able to do anything and everything that we can even imagine. So I'm thankful for that today. And so I've titled my, my message today that the power in prayer, power and prayer, either one, praise God, but how there is so much power when God's people pray. I remember last week when we talked about Balaam and Balak, that God honored the prayers of the Israelites, the, and the shout of the king was among them, and he was very pleased with that. And when God is pleased with the nation, he blesses her. So we can look for open windows of heaven, and we can just watch as he pours out his blessings that we can't even contain. All we have to do is receive them in Jesus' name. So we're going to go to Mark 5. And learn a little bit about prayer this morning uh, and about what God expects of us. Just a little bit of what he expects of us because we, we can do nothing. Our righteousness is like filthy rags, but we are only righteous because of what Jesus did. But uh, in Mark here, we're talking about Jesus and his disciples. And they came to the other side of the sea into the country of Gerasenes. And as soon as Yeshua got out of the boat, a man from a graveyard with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains. We just sang about that. He's able to break every chain. But the chains that had been ripped apart by him and the shackles had been broken and no one was strong enough to tame him. And through it all, night and day, at the graveyard and in the mountains, he kept screaming and gnashing himself with stones. And when he saw Yeshua from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. Crying out with a loud voice, he said, What's between you and me, Yeshua, Ben Elion? I'm warning you in the name of God, do not torment me. For Yeshua had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Yeshua began questioning him, 
what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. He was, he was possessed by many demons. He was bound, and then his mind was bound. He was inwardly bound like the outward chains were. And Jesus is the only one that was able to break those chains. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. He kept out begging him not to send them out of the country. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside nearby. The unclean spirits urged him, saying, send us into the pigs so we may enter them. So Yeshua gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, about 2,000 in number. I mean, this was not a little group of pigs. This was a lot. There were 2,000 of them. And they rushed down the cliff and were drowned in the sea. Because, you know, when the enemy comes, he comes to kill and steal and destroy. But Jesus said he came that we might have life and that more abundantly. So the herdsmen ran away and told the town and the countryside. And they came to see what had happened. Now they came to Yeshua and saw that the madman who had had the legion, he was sitting there dressed in clothes and in his right hand, mind and the people were scared. Those who had seen it described in detail what had happened to the man plagued by a demon or a legion of demons and they also told about the pigs and they began to beg Yeshua to leave their country. You know they knew they were not that they were raising unclean animals and it was in their in their law of uh, dietary laws they weren't even supposed to be eating pigs let alone raising them and selling them so he, they knew that Jesus was there to put things in order and as he was getting into the boat the man who had been infested with demons kept begging to remain with him Yeshua did not let him, but he told him, go home to your friends and tell them how much Adonai has done for you, how he showed you mercy. So he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Yeshua had done for him. And all were amazed when Yeshua had crossed over in the boat again to the other side a big crowd gathered around him and he was, as he was by the sea. You know, that's what we're supposed to do when God does something miraculous for us or in our lives. We're supposed to tell everybody around us and be the light that God means for us to be. We didn't get saved just so we could sit on a church pew. We got saved so that we could be light and salt to the world because that's what Jesus had intended for each one of us. It, there's no big eyes or little use in the kingdom of God. God wants all of us to be obedient to his word and go into all the world and preach the gospel. So then one of the synagogue leaders named Jarius comes. Seeing him, he falls at his feet. He begs him a great deal, saying, my little daughter is near death. Come and lay hands on her so she may be healed and live. Because remember, Jesus came to give life. So Yeshua went off with him, and the big crowd was following him. And pressing on him, there was a woman with a blood flow for 12 years who had suffered so much under many doctors, and she had spent all the money she had without benefit. Instead, she was growing worse. When she heard about Yeshua, she came through the crowd from behind and touched his garment. And by the way, if you don't know the laws over there, you wouldn't know that that was putting her own life in jeopardy because that you were not allowed to be, if you were a leper or had an issue of blood like this woman did, you were not allowed to be in a crowd of people. You were considered unclean. And that was a stoning offense. If you came deliberately into a crowd of people, you were supposed to stay a ways off and cry out unclean so people wouldn't 
catch what you have. So she came in to where Jesus was and pressed through the crowd behind, and touched his garment. She kept saying, if I touch even his clothes, I'll be healed. If you ever saw a tallit in Israel on the rabbis or on a lot of Jewish men, or it, it's a prayer shawl, and Jesus would have been wearing one of those, and they have knots in the hem of the garment that represent the laws, and it, it made, she knew that if she could get to the word, where the word was, there was power, where the word was, there was healing, and she knew if she touched the hem of that garment that Jesus was wearing, that she would be healed. That was faith. So right away, the blood flow stopped, and she felt her body, that it was healed from her disease. At once, Yeshua, knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples responded, you see the crowd pressing on you, and you say, who touched me? But he kept looking around to see who had done this. But the woman, scared and shaking, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in shalom or in peace and be healed from your disease. And while Yeshua was still speaking, messengers came from the house of the synagogue leader saying, your daughter is dead. Why do you still trouble the teacher? But ignoring what they said, Yeshua tells the synagogue leader, do not be afraid, only believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, Jacob, and John, the brother of Jacob. <clears throat> they came to the house of the synagogue leader and he sees commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And after renting, after entering, I'm sorry, after entering, he said to them, why are you making such a fat fuss and weep? The child didn't die, but it's only sleeping. You know what they did? They started jeering and laughing. But after sending all of them out, he takes the child's father and mother and those with him and enters where the child was. Then, taking hold of the child's hand, he tells her, Talitha koam, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old, and they were overcome with astonishment. But he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said something to eat should be given to her. So immediately, she got up. Mm, only one touch from the master's hand. Now when Yeshua saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now this is where, you know, we've been reading about some of the miracles that Jesus did, because he knew how to reach the Father. And when people would see him do miracles all over, they would ask him, how should we, how do we do this? How do you do this? And they would be told about his relationship to the Father, that he was the Son, and he would come to seek and save that which was lost. And Jesus then began, and this is in Matthew 5, and it talks about how Jesus taught people to pray. And we're going to go to Matthew 5. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus came in what he says, he speaks with peace and kindness and love. And he leaves joy and righteousness and peace behind everywhere he went. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who 
hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You ever think about that when you see two people argument, arguing and you think about taking sides with one of them? But it's better still if you can cause a peace between them. So that is a peacemaker. I'm thankful our president was able to get a sign a peace agreement between Israel and some of the Arab nations. I'm praying that God will complete the work that, that they have started there. Praise God. So we're, we're told to pray for the peace of, of Jerusalem. And so I really pray that they have the peace. Of course, we know the true peace will only come when Yeshua comes. But we are looking forward to that day, and a blessed day. We say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Now that was Jesus saying on account of him. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its flavor, how shall it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled, trampled under the foot by men. And you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand so it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. You remember singing that song as a child, most of you. And this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little. So remember, the let your light shine wherever you are. You don't have to be within a church. Of course not. You need to be out where people need to see the light. Praise God. He said he didn't come for people that were well. He came for those who were sick. And when people are not walking with Jesus, their whole head is sick and the heart of man is evil. So evil, who could know it? So we need to get the word out of the good news that Jesus came for them. And Jesus died for them and he rose again. And he wants us to be the light and salt for the earth. Praise God. So that men can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And that's what he did. He was he was lived a life without sin. He was the only one who could have paid the price for us. And he did it. He came and he lived a perfect life. He didn't sin not one time. He was always pleasing to the Father. I tell you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or seraph shall ever pass away from the Torah. Or call it a, the, some versions call it a jot or tittle. This one calls it a seraph. That shall never pass away from the Torah. That's the law of God in the Old Testament. Until all things come to pass. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, is this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Torah scholars, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, 
and whoever commits murder shall be subject to judgment. But I tell you, Jesus tells us, that everyone who is angry with his brother woo, shall be subject to ju judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, that word Raka, it means you're kind of stupid and you don't understand things. And you're, they said that word when they were disgusted with people. And that was a, a very belittling word. And he says, if people say that to a brother, they shall be subject to counsel, to the counsel. And whoever says you fool shall be subject to fire Gehenna. In other words, to hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering upon the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent while you are with him on the way. Otherwise, your opponent may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the assistant, and you will be thrown into prison. We would be with that. Amen, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid back the last penny that you owe. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you that one part of your body should be destroyed than that your whole body be thrown into a Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you that one part of your body should be destroyed than that your whole body would go to hell. And it was said, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But he said, to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So not only are you doing something wrong, you're causing other people to do wrong if you do go against the laws. And again, you've been... You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall carry out your oaths to Adonai. But I tell you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, for it is the throne of God, and, or by the earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your word be yes and be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist evil and an evildoer. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And the one waiting to sue you and take your shirt, let him also have your coat. Whoever forces you to go a mile, in those days, a soldier could walk along and ask you to go with him for a mile and carry his armor for him. But Jesus said, whoever would ask you to do that, go with him two miles. Go the extra mile. And that's when people come to you you're supposed to go the extra mile out of your way to help people. And so you can be the light and salt we've been talking about. And give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See, Jesus prayed for us. Even when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. So he 
is our great example, and we try to be as much like him as we possibly can. Of course, we're not going to be perfect like he was perfect, but we can strive to be so we can live as close to him as possible. So, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. We want to live that way. And he causes his son to rise out of the evil and good and sends rains to the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax to collectors do that same, don't they? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than anyone else? Even the pagans do that, don't they? Therefore, be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so, and so if we try to be perfect, the only way we know that we can do that is through Jesus. Because when we believe, the Bible says that we come to him by faith. That in the first place we have to believe that he is. And he is the Son of God. And we have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when we seek him with our whole heart, we'll find him. He says, knock, seek, and ask, and all of those things will be open unto us when we seek first the kingdom of God. So we need to seek Jesus and his righteousness so that we can be presented as righteous before the Father. That when God, the Father, looks at you or looks at me, he doesn't see our sin anymore because Jesus' blood washed it away. His perfect blood. It was only his blood that could do it. And it was his desire. He came all the way from heaven. The glories and the splendors of heaven he left behind to come and be born in a manger to a humble beginning. I think that's one of the reasons the Bible tells us not to despise small beginnings because Jesus didn't. He came and he was born in a manger. He was raised in a carpenter shop and he became the savior of the world. He gave, laid his life down to go to the shame and reproach of a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when he gave up the ghost on the cross, the veil in the temple was ripped in two. And that's what made it possible for us to go to the Father through the blood of Jesus. Because he paid the price. And he was the only one who could. And no one took his life from him. He said, I lay it down. It was his desire to be pleasing to the Father. And it was his desire to love us so much that we can have fellowship forever, ever and ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> so I, if you don't know the Lord and you're listening today, all you have to do is say a simple prayer. Father, I am a sinner. I know I need you to forgive my sins. I'm sorry for the sins. I repent, Lord. And I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. And I accept your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for my sin. And I ask him to come in. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and to be the Lord of my heart and mind and soul. And that you lead me by your spirit from this day forward. I want to be a child of the Most High God. And he'll do it. All you have to do is ask him. And they'll be rejoicing in heaven. There's a little song we used to sing. There's joy in the camp. Rejoicing round the throne. Joy in the camp. A sinner has come home. With singing and shouting. The great redemption song. Out of the darkness, into the light. Out of a sorrow, jubilant light. There's joy, wondrous joy in the camp. The Bible tells us even the angels rejoice in heaven when one comes home. Just like the prodigal son came home to his father and he made a big feast and he welcomed him home. 
Jesus is waiting to welcome everyone that will, whosoever will. Amen. So that's today's message. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope if you already know the Lord and walk with him, that it was a refreshing and what we're supposed to do to show our light and salt, be the salt of the earth. In Jesus' name, I pray for each one who listened in today, Father. I ask you to bring a blessing into their life that they can't even contain. And Father, that they will get so excited and go tell the world about you. Lord, as this great awakening is going to come across America and the world, Lord, I just thank you for it in advance. I praise you and I thank you for all the prayers that were said by leaders in our country, Lord, by spiritual leaders, Lord, by people who know that there's one race, Lord, the human race, one blood, and one new man in Christ Jesus. So we thank you today, Lord, for your word. And we thank you today, Lord, for what you're doing in the lives of your people. And we ask, us to, we ask Lord, that you go with us through the week and help us to do your will. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So, uh, Behold, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That